Um, Jamie Ritchie is a, a registered dietitian and holds a master's degree in, um, uh, in it as well from East Carolina University. She has acted as a clinical and consulting dietitian for skilled nursing facilities, hospice, home health care, and post-acute supportive living and rehabilitation settings for individuals living with brain injury, including learning services here in North Carolina. She is a certified brain injury specialist, or CBIS, and a board certified in gerontological nutrition. So I want to thank her so much for being here today and, um, you know, so to talk about something that really is important to every human, let alone individuals living with brain injury in particular. So thank you, Jamie, and we're going to get started. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, welcome, everybody. There is so much to say about nutrition and brain injuries. I could probably do a couple webinars, so I'm going to try to touch base on um, a variety of topics, and I think if you guys had additional questions or concerns about a specific topic, um, we can, um, I have my email address at the end for everybody. My objectives today are to discuss nutrition in the acute care setting, so acute traumatic brain injuries, review common obstacles in nutrition and brain injuries discuss dysphagia nutrition therapy, review nutrition recommendations for brain injuries, and to discuss the MIND diet, and I have some sample meal ideas for that. I just have, I think, one slide on a, a TBI overview. Um, it is caused by an injury to the head, by an external force. The most common um, reasons or um, the most common brain injuries are caused by falls and motor vehicle accidents. Almost 2 million people in the U.S. sustain a brain injury every year, and over 5 million Americans are living with a disability from a brain injury. Even people with mild TBIs are at risk for long-term and short-term complications and symptoms. Um, this is the only statistic I have regarding the symptoms of TBI. And it, the reason I bring anxiety and depression up is because they can impact eating patterns and food choices, which can lead to weight gain and obesity. However, weight loss and malnutrition can also occur from having anxiety and depression. Up to 70% of patients experience anxiety and up to 50% of patients experience depression after a traumatic brain injury. So the acute phase of traumatic brain injury, um, the first stage is really stabilization and assessment of injury. And this is, you know, right after their accident, when, they, when they're gone to the ER, when, when they're in the ICU. So this is just figuring out where the injury is, stabilizing it. The next stage is treating complications. This is usually a couple of weeks. However, in patients who are comatose, it may be much longer. So the you know, complication treating period may be pushed back until they are um, awake. And then the active rehabilitation stage, which can be weeks to months, depending on the severity of the brain injury. Um, I've worked for learning services for over 10 years, and um, most of our patients who've had brain injuries are in the hospital for at least a month, um, sometimes just a few weeks and then also maybe 20% of the time um, are they there for more than a few months. I have had a few patients who've been there for greater than six months, and this is you know, in the acute care hospital setting. Hypermetabolism is a big concern that dietitians struggle with in patients with brain injuries, um, and this is gonna cause significant weight loss, um, and this will really prolong um, treating those complications that I mentioned. So if someone is not getting the calories that they need and they also uh, have high metabolism, they're less likely to heal as quickly. So if you think about um, having the flu, which is a very simple thing that we're all very familiar with, we're not able to eat very much, we're not able to drink. You can all see most people who've had the flu say they've lost you know, 10 pounds um, and you just think about that in a more severe case, you know, you, you feel lousy, you feel tired, you feel weak just from that weight loss from, from the flu. 
um, that hypermetabolic state can last for weeks to months, depending on the severity of the injury or the additional injuries that have occurred, which, you know, in polytrauma cases where a patient has a brain injury, plus multiple fractures and possibly organ damage, um, that hypermetabolism is going to last even longer um, because they have to heal the brain, plus they need to heal bones. They may have open wounds that need extra calories to heal. I had a, a young girl years ago um, who was in her early 20s, and um, she was still requiring 3,500 calories four months after injury, and she was a small girl. She was like five foot five, 120 pounds. So her hypermetabolism was um, significant. I do see weight loss up to 15% in a week. I have worked in a hospital setting, and I do sometimes fill in at hospitals, and I do often see weight loss of that much in a week for patients who have had injuries, um, brain injuries. Early feeding. So for those reasons, early feeding, and when I mean feeding, I'm talking about tube feeding, um, is crucial in the first 24 hours. It's, it's often not appropriate to start feeding someone that quickly um, because uh, in the beginning of the slide, I'm talking about the stabilization assessment of injury. That is the important part. You need to make sure that the patient is stable, that they're breathing, that they're, you know, their critical things are, you know, everything is happening first to keep them alive. Um, the doctors aren't thinking about putting a tube in them. So dietitians in a hospital setting really try to keep an eye on these patients and um, recommend nasal gastric tube feedings as soon as possible to prevent catabolic stress. Um, and typically when we start tube feeding in the acute care setting, we start with trickle or trophic feeds this is a very small amount of calories at a time, something like 20 milliliters an hour, just to stimulate the GI system and to give uh, some calories and get everything starting to run, prevent constipation. And then on average, patients lose 15 pounds during acute hospitalization. Um, and this is not specific to brain injury. This is across the board with patients that are in a hospital setting. Other um, processes that are monitored by dietitians in the acute setting is fluid and electrolyte abnormalities. Um, so this is sodium, potassium, phosphorus, magnesium, calcium. All those need um, strict monitoring, replacement. Uh, because patients aren't going to be getting adequate nutrition, they have to make sure that all those electrolytes are being repleted. We also monitor making sure that there's not enough calories or there's not too many calories. Um, there are complications with overfeeding, um, such as high blood sugar, fatty liver, and pulmonary burden. Neurogenic bowel and bladder, which um, the most significant here is the bowel because we have to battle um, small bowel obstructions and constipation post-injury, and feeding tube issues. So assessing the placement of them, monitoring for intolerance and malfunction. Uh, protein needs in brain injured patients are up to two and a half times higher in acute TBIs. And this is something that the dietitians are able to monitor and deliver extra protein. There are different tube feeding formulas that provide higher levels of protein and then there are um, protein supplements. The two on the left, ProStat and ProMod, are able to be added to the tube, or they can be given orally. Um, I sometimes use them for patients at learning services. Um, you can put them, like I said, in the tube or in the mouth, and the dosage is quite small, so it's helpful for certain patients. The dose is um, one ounce, and that equals about 100 calories and 15 grams of protein. So I can easily give that a couple of times a day to boost the calories and protein. The two products on the right cannot be given in a tube. They are given orally. We often have to use these for, for patients with brain injury. Glucose monitoring is important. 
it is, um, I don't know the statistic, but almost every patient in acute care setting has high blood sugars and their blood sugars are monitored. Um, hyperglycemia is what happens in trauma. It's our body's, um, it happens when our bodies are healing. We send extra, send extra sugars throughout the body. However, this high blood sugar can uh, adversely impact traumatic brain injury. And there is increased mortality when the sugar is too high or too low. Too low is less common. It's usually is a response to too much insulin. Um, but there are negative neurological outcomes with high blood sugar and the brain injury severity can be worsened. Uh, in the chart, I have different um, blood sugar ranges that are normal, pre-diabetic, and diabetic for um, three different states. Fasting, which means has not eaten in at least eight hours, just eight, which we call postprandial, and then three hours after eating. Fat, um, the brain is composed of 60% lipids by weight. Um, I'm not going to pretend like I can say that word, but DHA is the most abundant fatty acids found in the brain. It has an anti-inflammatory benefit and may prevent or reduce traumatic axonal injury. DHA supplementation can promote brain cell growth and improve cell survival and overall outcomes. Um, the tube feeding formulas that we use in hospital settings are supplemented with, with DHA and uh, omega-3 fish oil. However, when someone is transitioned off of tube feeding to an oral diet, it's typically supplemented um, with these uh, in pill form. Overall acute care TBI summary. Um, an early, for dietitians, the early initiation of feeding is essential. Getting them to their nutrition goal as quick as possible while preventing complications. Um, monitoring that hypermetabolism and realizing it can last weeks to months. Significant weight loss is common. Extra protein and fat is necessary. And we usually try to limit carbohydrates due to um, hyperglycemia. The next section is really going to focus on post-acute care, and it's going to be the rest of the webinar. It's just kind of in the next setting. So post-acute care may be in a residential setting, could be neuro rehab that's you know associated with a hospital, can be skilled nursing, maybe um, home care with um, in-house or outpatient therapy. And there's going to be kind of five areas that we're going to be talking about: um, behavioral issues around eating, memory issues medications, altered sense of taste and smell, and dysphagia. Impulsivity. So this might be um, taking large bites, cramming food in the mouth, not swallowing. Um, this is something that we deal with. Um, and we have several patients who continue to have impulsivity with meals, and um, they will continue to have these issues. And so those patients we sit with at meals, some of them are um, alert and aware enough that you just have to mention those swallowing strategies before each meal. However, some you have to remind them uh, at every bite. So we might have to say, John, um, take a smaller bite, and then wait for him to take the bite, and then remind him to swallow. We might need to tell him to put his fork down or take a sip of water. Um, and so some people we have to say this continuously throughout a meal to prevent them from choking. Some people, actually I think only one of our clients, we put a mirror in front of him at meals, and this is because he has decreased sensation in his mouth, so he is not able to tell if he has food in his mouth, uh, and so um, he has to kind of look in his mouth and put his finger in there and kind of remove some of the food um, between bites or at the end of a meal. Um, another behavior challenge is acting out at meals. So this might be um, having very specific requests, wanting more food. Um, this is definitely a very common issue we see post brain injury. And what we do is we set limits and we stick with them. We use redirection. I have some examples of things that you might say to redirect um, this person. And it, you know, it's just really figuring out 
what works for them and knowing what they like. And so I have a variety of examples. So if someone is always asking for pizza, you can just say, well, we'll have pizza tomorrow, but today we are having chicken. Um, or you can say, we had that yesterday and we have it every Tuesday. Um, and today is Wednesday and Wednesdays we have, say it's chicken. If someone's asking for a snack or going to get a snack, like they start going in the kitchen or the refrigerator, um, you can, you know, say, well, we'll have a snack after we go for a walk or after we do blank, whatever the activity is. You can um, tell them that you want them to do something with you, just depending on uh, the person and you know how their, uh, what their personality is. Sometimes having them do something with you might, might help them. And then say, after we do this, uh, we will have a snack. You can tell them you just had a snack or that dinner is coming up soon and hopefully that will help. So, you know, we have some clients who will keep grabbing snacks and, and I'll say, you know, we're having dinner in about an hour. You don't want to spoil your appetite for dinner. Why don't you um, watch that TV show? One guy liked to watch Beyonce videos, so we would always put on a Beyonce video for him. Um, it's just kind of figuring out your patient. Um, or you can get them to help you with something. So. Um, some people really like to help out. So you can say, I want you to help me with dinner or I want you to help me with laundry. Can you do that? And then maybe we can look at snacks. Memory and food. If memory impairment is significant for, for the person with the brain injury, um, they might not remember that they ate. So I have one client who has been a, a patient of mine for a very long time. And his memory is very short, um, I don't know, you know, a couple of minutes. So he'll ask the same questions over and over again. He does not remember that he ate. Luckily, he's very pleasant, um, and he'll believe you. But some people aren't that way. And so you really just have to limit access to food, because if they don't remember that they ate, um, then they're going to want to eat. Eating is, is a normal part of our our lives and so if we haven't thought we ate we're going to go try to find food so some people will um, create a food journal or a food app so you know recording what you have at each meal might be helpful or you can download an app on your phone or your iPad depending on if, if you if you're into using those things and you can record what you've eaten and then you can kind of direct them back to that say like you know look at your food journal what did you eat and then get them to, to tell you that some people take pictures of food like if they're going out to eat just to kind of remind them that they've eaten and take a picture of them at the restaurant and print it out uh, scheduling meals scheduling activities that's kind of the same thing um, so you might have a white dry erase board or a chalkboard or even print out a schedule um, you could do sort of a daily schedule or you could have a weekly schedule, but put on there what time meals are and then fill in other activities so that you can always direct them to the schedule and say, um, well, we had breakfast at 8 o'clock and now it's what time? And then you can kind of get them to look, or look at their schedule and follow along. And then again, the redirection. So redirecting them. If they have a poor memory, sometimes you can use the same redirection statements over and over again. Medications is a big one. Um, as I said earlier, anxiety and depression are very common in uh, brain injured patients. And these medications may increase or decrease appetite. Um, and so this chart on the right has different categories on the left, mood stabilizers, antipsychotics, et cetera, and whether or not they increase or decrease appetite. As you can see, most of them have a risk of increasing weight gain. Um, uh, the biggest medic the biggest category of medications that I see that increases appetite and weight is the antipsychotics, um, specifically the atypical or second generation antipsychotics um, are going to cause an increase in appetite. Uh, in addition to working at learning services, I also work in mental health, and so I see a lot of these medications, and they are. Um, uh, there's just no way around it. They will, people will gain weight on Zyprexa. I've had patients gain 100 pounds in a year 
They'll tell me that they are never full when they take that medicine. Risperdal and Seroquel are also high up there. They typically cause weight gain. I can't say I've ever seen anybody on those meds and did not experience weight gain. Um, antidepressants can usually go either way, but they tend to go more towards increasing your weight, with the exception of Wellbutrin, which usually decreases your appetite. Um, stimulants, so thing, you know, stimulants are typically given in the acute care setting um, to kind of stimulate someone after they've had a coma or they've been in a coma. Um, and so I often see Ritalin, Adderall, Concerta, um, even Amitriptyline can be, I think, as a stimulant. Um, but that can cause a decreased appetite. Um, a lot of children are on these medications for ADHD or ADD. And I have a patient now who's on one of those, and he's been losing weight. He's just not hungry, and for other reasons, he just he sometimes just won't eat. He doesn't, you know, believe us that he's lost weight. Um, so that's a struggle. Caffeine and nicotine aren't really a medication, but they are drugs, and they both decrease appetite. So that is something to look at when. And if you have a patient who is not wanting to eat, look at their use of caffeine and nicotine. I've had several patients who abuse, it um, might sound like a rough word, but I think it's abuse, uh, caffeine. Um, and they drink coffee all day. Gosh, I have one patient, that's pretty much all he does is drink coffee. And But he puts a half a cup of sugar in one cup of coffee, and I'm not exaggerating. It's pretty ridiculous. Um, but that's the way he's been for 10 years. But just looking at those things, uh, addressing them if you can, if the patient is um, willing to, to change those habits. And then decreased sense of taste and smell. So um, most patients with a traumatic brain injury um, have a decrease in their ability to smell. I, I looked at one study that was just looking at mild TBIs and 55% of those patients experienced a loss of smell, and um, this was concussions when I say mild GBI. They did regain their sense of smell at the one-year mark. Um, I was not able to find studies on more significant uh, TBIs, more severe TBIs. Um, but the issue may be from the damaged nasal passages, depending on the injury itself, nerve damage in the nose or mouth, um, or direct injury to the olfactory system, which is the ability to smell the olfactory. Um, and so there's like three areas that um, make up the olfactory system. We have the orbitofrontal cortex, which is right above and behind our eyes. So if, if someone's had like a frontal lobe injury towards the front of the head, uh, that could be why they don't smell as well. The insular cortex is behind the ears. Um, or parallel to the ears, I would say. And then the olfactory bulb and primary olfactory cortex, which is really what most people think of when they think of the sense of smell. And that's kind of directly behind our nose and our brain. That's composed of several different um, areas. So the decreased sense of um, taste and smell. So if you have a decreased sense of smell, you're going to have a decreased sense of taste. Most of us probably know this. Most of us have probably pinched our nose to swallow something or take a pill at once in our lives. Um, and so that you can kind of think about it that way. Um, so it can be dangerous. If you can't smell, you're not going to be able to smell dangerous things like gas leaks or smoke or um, rotten food or drinks. Uh, so we need to ensure that fire and smoke detectors are working. Um, we need to monitor leftovers and expiration dates closer. So if your patient's at home, you need to be, you know, making sure that you're keeping an eye on the food and the expiration dates. And quit smoking. If, you're, if your patient is not able to smell so good and they're smoking, um, then their taste buds are going to be killed from the smoking. I've had hospice patients who, who have, or just, lots of patients who smoke and complain to me that they can't taste anything and they don't understand why and they put hot sauce on everything. It's because they're smokers. 
and then paying attention to the texture and appearance of food. So if I couldn't smell, I wouldn't be able to taste but a few flavors. And so what would be more important would be how the food looks and what the mouth feel is, what the texture is. So um, different patients who can't smell have different desires for different textures. So it's just figuring those things out. But it's usually just offering a variety of textures and things that look pretty. I thought this little um, picture on the right was interesting, that if you can't um, smell, then an onion tastes the same as an apple, which is horrible to me. <laughs> but um, a, un, let me go back to slide accidentally. Okay. But an onion does not have flavor. That's why it just has an odor. And I think we all know about that odor when you cut an onion and you start to cry. Okay, dysphagia. Dysphagia is very common in brain injuries. And it, it's uh, difficulty swallowing. There are three main types of dysphagia. Oral dysphagia, pharyngeal dysphagia, and esophageal dysphagia. On the left side, we have sort of signs and symptoms of oral and pharyngeal dysphagia. Uh, so those are things you can look for, or if you notice that you know, those, are, those things are happening, that it could be from oral and pharyngeal dysphagia. There's also esophageal dysphagia, which is further along, closer to your neck. Um, however, if you look at the two lists, they're very similar, with just a couple of differences. So it's really difficult to know what is going on and figuring out how to help. So that's why we have speech therapists that work with brain injured patients. Um, a speech therapist is necessary to evaluate what type of swallowing disorder is present and to prescribe the appropriate diet and treatment. So typically, speech therapists will order um, testing or perform the testing themselves. The first test is a FEES, which stands for Fiber Optic Endoscopic Evaluation of Swallowing, and that is the picture that's on the right. So that is where they put an endoscope up into the nose and they pass it down to right above the epiglottis, or right below the epiglottis when we swallow. So it's right above the vocal cords, the vocal folds. And then um, a second person, the assistant, which I've been the lovely assistant before, gives the patient different food textures uh, dyed with usually green dye um, or blue dye. And they watch on the uh, a computer screen, video screen, and see where the food is going. And so you give different textures, different liquids, and, and see what's happening. There is also a modified um, bariatric swallow study, the MBSS, and that's in the picture on the left. I've never seen that done. That's not done as often as the FEES test, um, but it is everything is monitored like through an x-ray. I'm going to use barium so you can see what is going on and where the food is going. Um, the only downside to these tests is it's only showing what is happening in that moment. So if a patient is having a terrible day, um, that's not a good time to do the testing. So typically, you know, therapists wait until they are stronger, doing better to do the, the fees testing so that you're capturing, you know, a, a good time. And now if someone is having a bad day and they have a fee schedule, it might be good to sort of reschedule that. Uh, bedside swallow exams are also performed by a speech therapist, and that is really just the speech therapist monitoring a meal while they're in bed or at, at the table. Recommendations the speech therapist may give are going to be the diet texture, so it might be mechanical soft or puree or regular, the liquid consistency, and we're going to talk about these um, next, um, foods to avoid the use of straws or, or not being able to use straws. Sometimes they might have to use adaptive equipment. This might be a special cup or a spoon or plate. They may need to um, prescribe assistance with meals. Some people have to have one-on-one -on -one assistance during a meal or giving the cues 
that we went over before, like those wallowing cues, and then meal time positioning, which is usually 90 degrees. But there might be times where someone has to have their head turned a certain way because of an abnormality or an injury. Um, and then a speech therapist also um, provides therapy to strengthen uh, their muscles and to try to strengthen those muscles that are causing the dysphagia. Um, and they also might um, sit with them during meals and have them do a variety of exercises during the meal to prevent them from having food go into the lungs. So dysphagia diets, I'm going to briefly go over those. Um, terminology is changing. I'm using the old terminology, which is the National Dysphagia Diet. Um, if you're interested in that, there is a new terminology coming out. Um, it's called IDSI, which is I-D-D-S-I. -D -D it stands for the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative. Um, and it's I've, I've been on some conference calls years ago about it, and it's, I think somebody in Australia and Canada are, are leading it. And it's, so it's everybody across the country uses the same terminology. And it's more complex. There's seven different levels of diet. There's five, I believe, different liquid consistencies. But we're not going to talk about that today. It hasn't been disseminated, and I've not seen it used anywhere. So we're going to be talking about the old terminology which is the National Dysphagia Diet. There are four levels. Level one is dysphagia or puree diet. And these foods are smooth, pureed, homogenous, very cohesive, pudding-like foods that require little chewing. Breads must be pureed or pre-gelled, and you can buy those pre-gelled breads. It's not something I've ever seen anybody make. Fruits and vegetables are pureed without nuts, seeds, or chunks. So if you were pureeing, um, let's say, corn, you can't do corn because it has that thick hull around it. Um, you can't puree anything with a seed. So raw tomatoes you wouldn't puree because those seeds aren't going aren't gonna to be smooth. Soups are pureed smooth. So if you had a you know, chicken noodle soup, you'd have to put that in a blender or you would maybe serve a different type of soup that's smooth. And then all meats and eggs are pureed. So these two pictures are um, pureed foods. The top is not as appetizing in appearance as the one on the bottom. However, the top one's not too bad. There's some texture to it. Um, it looks like maybe they used the fork to kind of manipulate the texture to make it look a little bit better. Um, you know, I sometimes see just like three beige blobs on a plate, which is not appealing at all. So um, you can spruce it up a little bit. You can use like a piping bag like you use for icing to kind of make it look a little bit nicer. But it has to be a pudding-like consistency. It can't be too thick. Um, down below, um, they used molds, and you can buy those. You you know make the pureed food, and then you put it in molds, and you freeze it, and then you reheat it in like a microwave. And so all three of those foods are pureed. They just look nicer because of those molds. Mm -hmm. The next diet is the level two, or dysphagia mechanically altered diet. This is cohesive, moist, semi-solid food that requires some chewing ability. All of the fruits and vegetables need to be fork mashable, which means you, you know, gently press the tongs of a fork down and it smushes. And it excludes most bread products, crackers, and dry foods. Breads need to be pureed or pre-gelled. Fruits should be soft, canned, or cooked. The only raw fruit allowed is a ripe banana. So typically, we just do canned fruit or bananas on this, a lot of applesauce and peaches, that kind of stuff. Vegetables need to be well cooked and soft and fork mashable. The pieces are no smaller. I'm sorry, that should be pieces, oh, in pieces smaller than a half an inch. I read that wrong. So this, this has to be smaller than a half an inch. Meat should be tender and moist, ground or cubed smaller than a quarter of an inch. So that's pretty small. You can see that picture up above. That meat is small enough. 
Um, some places I'll see they'll just chop it, um, but that's not enough. You can't just chop up your chicken, then it's going to be too dry. So you also have to moisten it with a gravy or a sauce. Um, meats are typically the most difficult. Sometimes I'll see uh, a speech therapist prescribe a mechanical soft diet with pureed meat. So some people have, can have um, soft side foods, but their meat still have to be pureed. Um, no dry whole grain cereals with nuts, seeds, and coconut, and avoiding foods that are difficult to chew with large chunks or nuts. And then the uh, level three diet, which is the mechanical um, dysphagia advanced. This is almost a regular diet, but it excludes hard, crunchy fruits and vegetables, sticky foods, and very dry foods. Um, breads and cereals should be moistened or soft. Fruits um, that are soft and peeled are acceptable, such as peaches, kiwi, melons, and berries. Avoid potato skins, corn, and raw vegetables. Meat should be tender, small pieces, or ground and well moistened, and avoid items that are difficult to chew. Chips and hard pretzels, popcorn, those sorts of things. The fourth diet I am not talking about because it's level four and it's a regular diet, so that includes everything. Thickened liquids. So some people with dysphagia have to be on thickened liquids, so during their swallow test that we've done, either the fees or the modified barium, they are now a prescribed a um, thickened liquid diet. Um, there are four levels. Thin is um, baseline, normal liquid, so water, juice, tea, coffee. So they can, they can drink anything. Nectar thick is the next level. And that's medium thickness liquids and um, includes nectar and vegetable juices and handmade milkshakes. Those are the only ones that are allowed at natural state. Everything else has to be thickened with commercial thickeners or uh, you have to purchase pre-thickened to nectar thick thickness. It's kind of a mouthful to say. Um, and I'll talk about the thickeners on the next slide. Um, honey thick is thicker than nectar and resembles the consistency of honey at room temperature. And again, you can use commercial thickeners to thicken to the correct consistency, or you can purchase pre-thickened pre liquids. And then the thickest is pudding or spoon thick, and it, and it sounds like it is. So it's not pourable, and it's comparable to pudding or yogurt. Um, I've been a dietitian for about 12 years, and I've only ever had two patients on this. One, he's still on it. Um, he's been on it for about two years now. So everything he drinks, we have to thicken so it's thick like pudding. Otherwise, he is at risk for having um, aspiration and pneumonia. Um, so thickened liquids are used to help people swallow safely. If they're not properly thickened, we increase the risk of swallowing problems and aspiration, pneumonia, and malnutrition. Do not add ice to thickened liquids. Um, it's going to dilute it and make it thinner, and then it's no longer the correct consistency. Do not serve jello or ice cream because they are a thin liquid. So if you think about those things, they are actually thin. They just are um, heated or frozen to the to thicker consistency. Soup and milk and cereal must also be thickened to the correct consistency. This is often not thought of for some people. And so they'll give them chicken noodle soup, but they're supposed to be on honey thick liquids. Well, the broth in the chicken noodle soup is too thin and they're gonna choke. And then being mindful of dehydration. That is a critical component. These liquids just don't taste as good. They're not as desirable. They're thick and kind of slimy. And so they just are not accepted as well as regular liquids. And so you have to try harder and offer more frequently these thickened liquids. These two slides are um, what thickened liquids should look like, depending on the, the type. Um, and the, um, the top picture, I believe, is from a cornstarch thickener um, package. And so that's what most places use, is a cornstarch powdered looking um, thickener. And on the label, 
it tells you exactly how to make it. I'm not going to talk about that today, but you can just look at the label. You can order, you can buy it um, online. Amazon has it, um, but you can go to any uh, Rite Aid, CVS, Walgreens, and they will have um, this thickener. It's typically on the top of the bottom shelf of the section that has Boost and Insure. There's also a gel thickener, um, and it is, um, I think people like the gel thickener better. The only one that I'm familiar with is a brand name, Thick, Simply Thick. They're easy to contact if you ever needed any. They send you like a free box and will come and explain to you how to use it. Nutrition supplementation, um, a big one is omega-3 fatty acids. Um, it will, um, the supplementation may slow the recovery of um, motor function. Sorry, a loss of DHA in the body may slow the recovery of motor function, anxiety-like behaviors, and cognitive deficiency. Animal sh studies show that omega-3 fatty acids help minimize brain damage and protect against it. Most clinical studies use DHA doses of 2 to 6 grams per day. So this would be 2,000 to 6,000 milligrams per day without adverse effects. Um, some hospitals use higher doses for briefer periods of time post-injury, but typically I see closer to 1,200 to 2,500 milligrams a day in a post-acute care. Vitamin D supplementation is really beneficial. Um, vitamin D deficiency increases the risk of very lots and lots of things. I just listed a few here. Uh, and there are doses listed for deficiency, so if someone is diagnosed with a deficiency, they may be prescribed very high doses, like 500 units once a week. And the vitamin D3, um, 500 to 2,000 units daily, and that's sort of uh, an ongoing recommendation. So the high dose is just once a week for about two months, and then you're on the maintenance dose for indefinitely. You have to use caution because toxicity can occur. Vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, so it will accumulate in your fat, and then if you were to lose weight, then you can have uh, toxic effects. Now, vitamin C and E are both antioxidants and are going to be helpful with any inflammation. Um, and the doses here are 500 milligrams twice a day for vitamin C and 2,000 units a day for vitamin E. These pictures show what foods are high in vitamin C and vitamin E. You can aim for those in your diet. Caffeine is not a recommendation, but I did want to mention it. It's a stimulant, and it needs to be used with caution. You need to monitor sleep and appetite because it does interfere with both. It interferes with some medications, and it is contraindicated, meaning it should not be used with patients with anxiety and cardiac or heart issues. So all these foods listed here have caffeine in them. So some people say, I don't have caffeine, I drink tea. Well, tea has caffeine. So if you're drinking five or six cups of tea a day, you know, that's a lot of caffeine. For um, your knowledge, it's only recommended that we have no more than 400 milligrams of caffeine a day for safety. And that's for um, healthy Americans. Brain injuries and exercise. It's recommended we exercise. It's helpful for their brain. It improves neuronal functioning before and at, or during and after exercise. And I would, if you have a brain injury and you have disabilities, I would work with a physical therapist in coming up with a proper exercise program. Uh, appropriate diet for brain injuries. So a well-balanced diet that's rich in fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, limited, saturated, and hydrogenated fats, and sodium, which is salt. You should have a variety of food to ensure adequacy of all vitamins and minerals. The MIND diet is the most promising diet for prevention of neurodegeneration and improving cognition. So the MIND diet is the Mediterranean DASH intervention for neurodegeneration delay diet. So that's what we used to call the MIND diet. And it was created by uh, a team at the Rush University. University Medical Center, and I'm going to be talking about that diet in the next couple of slides. I'm going to kind of zip through here, but you'll have a copy of the slides so you can read them afterwards. Um, leafy green vegetables is key, one to two servings a day of these. A serving is one cup raw or half cup cooked. Um, one to two servings a day of other vegetables, same serving, one cup raw, half cup cooked. 
berries, so four to five servings a week of berries, and a serving is half a cup. Whole grains, at least three servings a day of whole grains. Um, a serving is like one slice of bread or half a cup of rice or half a cup of cooked grains, such as brown rice, oatmeal, or quinoa. One serving a day of nuts, a serving is a third of a cup. It's a very small serving. Um, I recommend you know, switching it up, maybe one week buying almonds, the next week buying cashews, et cetera. Four to five servings a week of lentils and beans. A serving is half a cup cooked. Again, mix up the, the type. Two servings a week of fish. A serving is three ounces. That is quite small uh, to some of us. It's about the size of a deck of cards or like um, the palm of a woman's hand. Uh, three servings a week of poultry. Again, the serving is three ounces. Um, olive oil should be used as a replacement for butter and margarine and used as the primary cooking oil. I'm putting wine and beer and spirits in here because it is recommended on the MIND diet. However, it is, alcohol is not recommended in, in TBIs, but I thought you guys might just need want to know that that is in there, and it's recommended to have one drink per day. So this is um, pretty alarming and might be the most um, uh, rough advice <laughs> is foods to avoid, and it's fast food, fried food, whole fat cheese, red meat, butter, and margarine, and it, the suggested serving is once a month or less for each food group. So if you go to McDonald's and you get a Big Mac with cheese and French fries, that's all the top four um, all in one meal. So I guess it's good that you can go and get a Big Mac with French fries once a month, um, but that's it. Um, you guys are going to have a copy of this slide again, so I'm not going to read these to you, but there are five breakfast examples, five lunch examples, and it, you know, it really includes most foods. It's just really focusing on including those good, healthy foods that I listed. And five dinner examples, you know, you can switch out different things, you know, different vegetables. I just kind of came up with some examples. Um, and here's my email addresses if you wanted to uh, ask me more questions. Um, and then we're going to see what questions you guys have. Perfect. Thank you so much. That, I learned so much in that presentation. I'm really excited to go home and cook some dinner to do my meal planning for the week. I thought it was perfect. So I hope that you guys all um, learned something for from today. So let me just see if there are any questions so far. If you have any questions, um, you know, write them in the chat box right now. Um, let's see. Okay. So we have a question. Do some patients get TPN prior to getting a feeding tube? Um, some people, so TPN is total parenteral nutrition, and that is nutrition that is put in a vein. So some people might not be able to tolerate any nutrition in their GI system. So they might have had an obstruction. Um, they might have had some injury to their intestine. They might have a variety of things. So some people do need TPN. TPN is invasive. It can cause infections. It's expensive difficult to monitor, um, and so I would say only if there's a complication where you cannot use the GI tract do we use TPN. Okay. Okay. Um, so the next question is, regarding the acute phase of a brain injury, how do you help manage fluid status in the setting of permissive hypernatremia uh, with cerebral edema, for example? Are there resources that you might recommend to help with this? Um, that's a, I have not dealt with that personally. Um, typically, the treatment of the patient is, you know, directed by the doctor, and so the doctor would may tell me what their goal range is for their sodium levels. So if there is permissive uh, hypernatremia, which is high sodium blood levels that I would help monitor to keep it within that range. 
Um, but uh, I defer to the doctor in that case. Um, so we have a little bit of questions around, you know, red meat, obviously it has a lot of protein in it, um, as well as like, you know, uh, uh, butter has a lot of high fat content. So why, um, why do we avoid kind of red meat and butter and those type of foods? Good question. Um, I would definitely, um, if I were you, go look up the MIND diet, and you can probably read a lot of the science behind it, but red meat and butter, you know, they come from animals, and there is link to increased prevalence of cancers with red meat. Uh, inflammation is the biggest component, though, is that red meat can increase the inflammation, which is um, going to increase the risk of the, the brain inflammation and the markers of, uh, you know, dementia and those sorts of things. Um, so this is, you know, if, if you're someone, I would say if you're someone that eats red meat every day, I know that that's not healthy for anybody. I would try to cut back to maybe a couple of times a week, and, and that might be, you know, um, a, a good start. I do think once a month is very strict, um, but that is what this diet um, is, is tested and has proven to prevent um, the, the decline in cognition and dementia. Uh, what would you say is your recommendation for how much water a person should drink after a traumatic brain injury and, you know, that if no swallowing issues are there, um, how much water? Yeah, so it depends on the person's size. Generally, it would be about, um, I'll make sure I say this right, I'm going to get my calculator. I think it's one ounce per kilogram. So, um I do things in kilograms and it's in milliliters, so I just want to make sure I'm doing it right. Yeah, so I would say if you could figure out how much you weighed in kilograms, so you would take your weight, let's say it's 140, and you divide it by 2.2 is the factor, you would get a number that's 63.6. That's about how many ounces you should drink a day. Now, if someone is morbidly obese, let's say someone's 400 pounds and you divide it by 2.2, that's 180 ounces. So um, it's sometimes difficult to assess that um, exactly how much, but um, we take an adjusted way and, and there's a bunch of calculations. But if you had a specific situation, you could email me. Okay. Um, do you have experience using exogenous ketone bodies, keto salts, with patients in the acute care settings? And have you seen positive outcomes with these? I'm not familiar with that. No, I'm not. Um, I have worked in acute care settings, but it's um, a like a long-term acute care hospital, so it's not in the ICU. Um, so I, I don't know any. I'm not familiar with that. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, and so, are, are there any resources out there that people can kind of take a look at, just for like nutrition in general, and this is a brain injury that you like, or is it really just we were talking before how it's really hard to find the yeah. information of, you know, what is good nutrition after brain injury. So is there anything yeah. out there that you like that you can? It's tough. There's so much misinformation out there um, that you can go to any website that anybody wrote and, you know, and not know if it's, it's true or not. I would look, when you're looking for materials, look to see who wrote it. I would look to see if a dietitian wrote it and those credentials are RD or a doctor, MD, um, I would look to see, are they selling you something? So if it's someone who is selling you a supplement or pills, or you're buying you know, something that you might wanna be a little bit cautious to believe them because they have something to gain, right? They want to gain your business and your money. So I would really look to see who is writing it. In terms of a good resource, I like to use, um, there's a resource called Nutrition 411, and it is all written by dietitians. So there's different topics. You can just type in whatever the information is, and it is reviewed by dietitians, written by dietitians, edited by dietitians. So I trust that Nutrition 411. It has all kinds of clinical, it has healthy meal planning, has diabetes, et cetera. Regarding brain injury, I don't know of anything specifically. Um, I've compiled things from here and there over the years. There's lots of books out there, but 
um, I don't recommend a certain one. Okay. All right. Well, those are all the, the questions that we have. Um, if you have any additional questions, you can either contact Jamie or directly with these emails here. You can contact webinar at beyond.net. Um, as I mentioned, the, the slides are actually going to be recorded and put onto our website so you can access them that way, but I'll also try and um, attach them to your follow-up email. If you want the slides that they don't show up in your uh, in your follow-up email, just give a, a shout out to webinar at beyond.net to and I'll get those at, that access to you. Um, I'm gonna put up a brief um, just a little poll here uh, really quickly to see if you found this webinar beneficial. Um, so you can click yes, you know, kind of neutral, like neither here nor there, or you can hit no. Um, and you'll see that again in your survey, but just to get a, a quick sample um, from you guys. So I really appreciate you guys coming uh, and uh, attending today in the webinar. Thank you so much to Jamie. That was so great. Um, and I hope to see you on the next webinar that we have. Uh, if you'd like to be updated on any type of webinars that we have in the future, you can join our e-blast list, uh, just a monthly kind of uh, email that is sent out to hear about what we're doing. So I appreciate it. If you have any additional questions, feel free to send them through. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.